A conversation between Alan and Gianna, the office counselor of a company. First, you have some time to read questions one to six. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions one to six. What's up, Gianna? You look like you're in bad shape. Yes. Maybe I'll get sick leave from the boss and finally catch up on some sleep. I've barely eaten and slept in days. Those are warning signs of occupational stress. How are things at work? Terrible. After all the layoffs lately, the workload is totally overwhelming for everyone that's left. So I spend every waking moment in the office. I'm kept busy all the time. So you need to take a few minutes break every so often to clear and refresh your mind. But my boss will complain I'm not hard working. She's so capricious that you can't predict her reaction sometimes. Maybe your boss just doesn't have a clue about how much you're really doing. Keep her updated on your achievements and projects. Also insist that she prioritize everything so you can manage your time better. That's right. I suppose that would help me regain some sense of control, but I'm afraid that she'll take that as a sign of laziness and give me the axe. So take the initiative and hit the job hunting trail now. You'll be surprised at how many opportunities are out there. Well, that's encouraging. Anyway, you should cheer up and get rid of the situation. You know, according to a survey, about forty percent of all people. Find their work very stressful, and twenty-five percent develop mental or physical diseases. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions seven to ten. So serious! I didn't know that. How do the problems start? You know, they start when conflicts at work induces stress. Your body reacts by flooding the bloodstream with hormones that tense up your muscles and increase your blood pressure. This is meant to save you in a fight or flight situation. But leads to a host of illnesses, ranging from insomnia and headaches to heart attacks, when it occurs regularly over an extended period of time. What should I do to prevent such things happening? Well, most occupational stress is attributed to a recognized lack of control. You should act in advance to relieve the problems. For example, you should actively pursue career opportunities. Rather than quietly worry about getting fired, of course you can't control everything, so you need to help your mind and body cope. Keep a journal to release your frustrations. Take short walks to calm down, or if necessary, simply take a mental health day. That is the end of part one. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to two students talking about a presentation on time management. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now, listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Hi, Mark. What are you doing? Hi, Lucy. Well, I, I'm preparing this seminar on time management. I'm supposed to do a presentation on the topic next week. Ironic, isn't it? I'm probably the worst student when it comes to time management. I don't think you're that bad compared to some other people I know. Do you need some help with it? Yeah, I just don't know where to start. To be honest. When are you doing the presentation? I'm supposed to hand in the draft on Wednesday at 11 a.m. The presentation is scheduled for 10 a.m. this Friday. That's not too bad. This gives you the whole weekend to prepare. Let's brainstorm some ideas, shall we? 
Do you want to get a pen and paper to jot down some thoughts? I think you should start with a broad general statement. For example, I read somewhere that organising time is a skill like learning to drive or tying your shoelaces. Then you could move on to discussing the common problems people have with managing time. That's not a bad idea. One of the common problems is putting things off. Yeah, you could also mention some common signs of this symptom, such as last-minute holiday shopping, pulling off visits to the doctors or the dentists. Another problem is relying too much on your memory and not writing things down. Do you mean not keeping a diary or a planner to plan the tasks? That's right. For example, writing down what I need to do in a diary or planner helps me remember what I need to do and makes me more focused on the tasks for the day. Good idea. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. That reminds me of something I've been meaning to do for a while now. Anyway, I should also include some advice on how to deal with the problem, shouldn't I? Sure, you can talk about some ways of stopping procrastination. I guess making a to-do list can help one focus on what needs to be done. Definitely. Another way to deal with the problem is to prioritise and do the hardest job first, the one which requires the most effort and concentration. Also, my tutor recommended that I should break big projects into small parts with a specific goal. Having an action plan has worked for me. I usually make a list of small tasks I need to do to achieve a goal. Sometimes I just don't feel like getting down to work because a task seems too overwhelming for me to even think about. This technique helps me reduce psychological pressure. If I think of a project as a set of easily achievable tasks, don't you think? I know what you mean. I often feel like that myself with the statistics project I've been doing this term. I'm well behind and the deadline is next week. I think setting deadlines and sticking to them can help one to achieve goals. You can discuss this aspect in your presentation too. A good point. Setting deadlines can also help one become more realistic about the time it takes to do tasks. Another point you could include is how to deal with interruptions. OK. I guess blocking in time to handle unpredictable interruptions can help one stay focused. Not just that. Some interruptions, such as phone calls, can be easily avoided by using answering machines, for example. Saying no, which is one of the most useful words in English, is also very effective. It can be tough sometimes, but you've got to learn to say it nicely but firmly. I think you've got enough ideas here to start with. Definitely. Thanks a lot for your help. I just need to type the ideas up and I think I'm all set. Do you think you can lend me your laptop for a couple of hours? Mm, I'm afraid I can't. I've got to finish my own project. Never mind. I'll use one at the library. You certainly know how to say no. <laughs> Learned it the hard way. Got to go now. Good luck with the presentation. Cheers. See you later. Now turns to part three. Part 3. You are going to hear a tape recording of instructions and advice, which a woman called Martha has left for her friend John, who is coming to stay at her house and take care of it while she is away. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hello, John. Welcome to the house. 
I'm really pleased that you can be here to look after my house while I'm away. Here are some things you need to know about the house. Important stuff like when the garbage is collected. In fact, let's start with the garbage, which is collected on Friday. Just write garbage on the calendar on the days they take it away. Put it out on Friday every week. That'll be Friday 22nd, Friday 29th and Friday 5th. It's a really good service. The trucks are quiet and the service is efficient. The bin will be put back outside the house empty. It's a good idea to put it away quickly. This street can be quite windy. I once watched my next door neighbour chase her bin the whole length of the street. Every time she nearly caught up with it, it got away again. The waste paper will be collected this Tuesday. That's Tuesday 19th. There's a plastic box full of paper in the front room. Please put it out on Tuesday. The truck will come during the day. If you don't mind collecting old newspapers and other paper and putting them in the box, I'll put it out when I come home. The paper people only come monthly. I have some things to give to charity in a box in the front room. Would you put it out on Monday the 25th, please? It's a box of old clothes and some bed linen which I've collected, plus a few other bits and pieces. Be careful when you pick it up, because it's heavier than you might expect. The charity truck will come by during the day on the last Monday of the month. If you want to use the library, you'll find it on Darling Street. I've left my borrower's card near the telephone. It has a very good local reference section if you want to find out more about this city. I'm sorry to say we don't have a cleaner. Oh yes, filters. Please would you change the filters on the washing machine on the last day of the month, which is Sunday the 31st. We find that the machine works much better if we change the filters regularly. The gas company reads the meter outside the house, so don't worry about that. I think that's all the information about our calendar of events. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Well, John, I'm trying to think what else I should be telling you. As you know, I'm going to a conference in London. I hope to have a little time to look around. It's a great city. I do hope I manage to get to at least some of the theatres and museums. I'm looking forward to all the things I have to do at the conference too. I'm giving a paper on Tuesday the 26th and there are a couple of really exciting events planned later in the conference programme. I hope to meet up with an old teacher of mine at the conference. She taught English literature at my old high school and we've kept in touch through letters over the years. She teaches now at the University of Durham and I'm really looking forward to seeing her again. By the way, I expect you're hungry after your trip. I've left a meal in the refrigerator for you. I hope you like cheese and onion pie. Would you do me a favour, please? I haven't had time to cancel an appointment. It was made a long time ago and I forgot about it until this morning. It's with my dentist for a check-up on Thursday the 28th. Could you please call the dentist on 816-2525 and cancel the appointment for me? Thanks a lot, John. One last thing. When you leave the house, make sure the windows and doors are shut and set the burglar alarm. The alarm code number is 91 Two zero enter. Have fun. I'll see you when I get back. This is your friend Martha saying goodbye. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the process of fossilization. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The foremost exhibition in any great natural history museum is almost invariably a skeleton of a large dinosaur, often the famous Tyrannosaurus rex or T-rex as it's usually known. Thus, one would think that these skeletons are plentiful, one for each museum, and more to spare in the basement. Well, here's an interesting fact. Almost every one of those T-Rex skeletons are just copies of the original fossils, and we only have 20 sets of these in the whole world. And the most complete is still missing one-fifth of its bones, and the rest are missing a lot more. And given that these dinosaurs once numbered in the thousands, and existed on this earth for perhaps three million years, you can realize an obvious fact. Fossilization is actually an extremely rare occurrence. Fossilization can only occur when, after an animal dies, it is buried in soft mud or silt relatively quickly, before the body completely rots or is torn to pieces by scavengers. Given this fact, the overwhelming majority of fossils are in marine sediment, where former marine life sank to the sea bottom, where sediment was being continually deposited. This means that we have a fairly good idea of the life in Earth's ancient oceans, but a much sketchier view of the land-based life forms. Fossilization on land needs water and mud, meaning that it is most often near ancient river sites and lakes but it is still so rare that there are, in fact, large stretches of geological time about which we don't quite know what was happening at all. So, given that fossilization is so rare, the natural question is, what can increase its odds? Well, fossilization mostly occurs with organisms which meet three basic criteria. One, they must have hard body parts, for example, shells, plates, bones and teeth. Unfortunately, the soft parts just rot away far too quickly to be fossilised. And I say unfortunately because it is often the soft fleshy features that most interest us. An elephant's trunk, for example, would not fossilise and from the skeleton alone we would never know the trunk was there. The second criterion for more likely fossilisation is that the organism in question must have existed in considerable numbers and be spread over a wide geographical range. This simply increases the statistical probability that one of them will one day be fossilised and hopefully found. Finally, and by the same logic, the species needs to have existed on the earth for a long time and the longer the better. So, these are the three main criteria, but there are others. Being a large size, for example, helps us to notice and discover them as fossils more easily. And being a marine organism, as mentioned, helps also. Trilobites, a strange sort of ancient crab, are a perfect example. Their body structure was one of hard plates. They existed over virtually the whole world of their time and over a huge span of geological history, over 250 million years in fact one of the longest ranges of any creature ever. Added to this, some species could grow to relatively large sizes and they lived in the sea. Perfect. These creatures meet all the criteria and as a result, museums all over the world are spilling over with trilobite fossils of all shapes and sizes. As far as fossils go, they are common. So, let's think about T-Rex once again. It too basically meets all the criteria that we mentioned. It has hard parts, being the bones, had some dispersion, and had been around for a long time, although it cannot compare to trilobites in this respect. However, it does have one important advantage over trilobites. It is large, very large, which means we can discover it far more easily than many other fossils. And here's another advantage. Dinosaur hunters are a dedicated and fanatical breed, continually at work in all the likely sites of the world. Basically, us human beings are fascinated by these creatures. So much that we are always searching for them, probably more than any other types of fossil, meaning that more T-Rexes will inevitably spring up in the future, and one is certainly glad for this.
That is the end of part 1.